I pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to my black people. To my black people. I pledge to develop. My mind and body to the greatest extent possible. I will learn all that I can in order to give my best to my people in the struggle for liberation. Welcome to this BFI at Home event. My name's Matumba Kabalika, and this evening I'm joined by Charlize Antoinette Jones, Rebecca Woodfork, and Sean Richards to discuss their film, Judas and the Black Messiah. Congratulations, first of all, guys, on an incredible uh, film. It is, it's just beautiful, um, so impactful, so powerful, so moving. I would love to dive in and get talking about how, you know, creating this, recreating, I guess, the specificity of an era and uh, where you begin with something like that. And I guess, first of all, a question that I have for all of you is, what drew you to the project? Um, Rebecca, would you love to kick off? Absolutely, thank you. Um, nice to meet you and nice to see everybody. Um, what drew me to the project was, um, basically my childhood was sort of wrapped up in the civil rights movement and uh, the time period was like going, stepping almost into my parents' marriage and, uh, the things that they had to fight against. And then also um, Shaka, the director, of course, um, Ryan, who I'd worked with previously before on um, Black Panther along with Sean, but um, the importance of the Black Panthers and needing their story to be told in the authenticity and then aligned with that was my subject, the Afros. So that was it. And um, Charlize, how about, how about you? It was, it was a couple of reasons. Um, Shock and I are long-term collaborators and friends. And um, he's one of my favorite directors to work with. He just lets you do your thing. And that was exciting for me because uh, 1969 and you know this period specifically is one of my favorites in fashion um, of all time. And then um, like Rebecca, similarly, Rebecca, I, I too wanted the another telling of um, of what happened, you know, in that time, you know, what the Black Panthers were actually doing, you know, because I don't think we have ever really seen a movie that really shows the Panthers feeding children like this and shows like that they weren't anti-white people, you know, they were like, you know, pro um, all marginalized people coming together, you know, to fight against oppression, right? And so um, I just thought that was a really important thing to be told, especially now, you know, in the political climate that we're in, it just felt really timely and it resonated with me, particularly as a black woman. And 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 Sean, love to hear the same from you. Well, for me, it, it was sort of a multitude of things. You know, being a 68 baby growing up in the 70s, I remember hearing about Black Panthers in a not in a not a positive way at all. And that was in Britain, you know, there was this fear of them and that there could be something very negative attached to them. So from a historical aspect, it absolutely fired my soul. I love making period feature films. I really wanted to work with Ryan again after working on Black Panther. It was a joy to, to, meet, um, to meet Shaka, but on a more personal note for me, um, come, I have a, my, my son is half Jamaican, born in London, and so it kind of fueled me because I identified with mothers who've seen their sons, so many women who've been through loss, and, and how fierce African American women are to put themselves on the line in that way. I mean, what a phenomenal story to tell and, and a responsibility. I know all of we creatives, we all felt that responsibility so personally. And I, you know, something that you've kind of all touched on, which is so resonant throughout the film, it's so, it's so cohesive. There's such a, a sense of it being um, of one. And um, I feel like that's so rare. I really would love to know um, how did you guys work together, you know, to kind of create this um, wonderful sense of unison across all your different departments? Honestly, you know, we, we shared our research with each other. Um, you know, I, I had a bunch of photos and I remember, you know, and I put them up everywhere in our department. And I remember like when Rebecca came in, 
um, for Daniel's fitting, we just looked at all the photos together and like, you know, we really talked about his look and, you know, and she was like telling me her ideas and things she had spoke to Shaka about. So, you know, just like constant communication like that and sharing of resources. I remember um, there was a moment where we realized Chacha Jimenez's hair was red. And I was like, oh my God, Rebecca, his hair is red. And I have this photo for you. Um, and she's like, what are you talking about? Because <laughs> I think the only photos we had seen until that point were black and white. And so she had to, then you have to change like the entire wig after that, when we realized his hair was red. And thank God, because he actually came to set. The real Cha-Cha Jimenez is still alive. And he actually came to set. Um, but yeah, there was like one photo I found where his hair was red. So it was just constant communication and sharing of research and, you know, stuff like that. Any, does anyone else want to jump in on that? You know, I think that the idea sometimes, at least for American culture, is that when you have more than one of us in a room, for whatever reason, we, I think, sometimes assume that we can't get things done. And there's been this negative connotation for years and, I mean, decades, right, of uh, you stand over there, you stand over there, we can't intermingle, we can't connect. And I think my... I grew up as an athlete, so I'm an athlete first. And I always say that filmmaking is like track and field, where like the hair, makeup, wardrobe, we're like the hundred yard dash. Mm -hmm. And that the, you know, we go to set and by then that's like the shot put and we see the electrics and you kind of meet everybody. But I feel like at the mm -hmm. end of the day, my main goal was to be a team always. Mm -hmm. And that if I wasn't, then someone needed to pick me up. And if somebody else wasn't, it was just a back and forth where I've worked on projects before where you are quicker to throw someone under the bus if they throw you under the bus, it's a tag team where this was, there is no absolutely positively no way, shape or form that I was going to leave this film without feeling like I didn't have a family at the end of this, particularly at base camp with hair, makeup, wardrobe and costumes because we had trying days. You know, this wasn't an easy film. It was one of the hardest films, but the most rewarding. So to end our show and to look at each other and to see these two women that even through trial and tribulation, I feel like I have friends, sister, family for life. So that was always the goal for me. I think it, I think that that sense um, really shows in the film. I think that, you know, you can, it kind of comes through and in, in just, as I've said, that sense of cohesion and unity, which I think um, it's just so important in recreating an era and also speaking to, to real people. Um, I'd love to hear you guys talk a bit about how Shaka works and how you worked with him um, on creating the, the hair and makeup and costume. Early on, you know, we chatted um, about keeping everything real and that we didn't want to see, um, and not to call it anyone else's work because I think everyone is you know, just as important, all the shows to get to this one, that we learned our mistakes, but I think that the Afros needed to identify with the same hair texture of the other, of the people's, of the person's hair growing out of their head. And that we wanted to have a texture and a fiber that matched, you know, from 4C to 4AB3, you know, and keep going. Um, and so he gave me that liberty. And so it was really nice that when I would come to him with ideas, he was like, he'd look at me and say, you're the expert. And I was like, okay, great, I love it. Let's just run with it. So it made it really nice. It was um, all hands on deck, but my voice mattered for sure. But it's also so incredible because I genuinely think it's the first time when I, and I mean this in the best possible way, was, wasn't, you know, you're like, it felt so real. I wasn't going, hold on. I think sometimes you go, wait, what happened there? Yeah. Like this was just, it was incredible how the, the 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 level of nuance and detail. I was entirely blown away. Um, and we had a, a, an average of a hundred wigs working a day. Wow! Everybody on first team, except for maybe three or four actors, didn't have wigs, but everybody else had wigs. Wow! Um, and I guess Charlize and Sean, from your perspectives, how how did that plug in, and how did you work with Shaka? Um, well, Shaka and I have been working together uh, for about nine years. So, you know, we started our careers together. And so we have like this, like almost nonverbal kind of um, uh, language and communication. Like I'm that at this point, we've done like four or five projects together. So I kind of have a good sense of like what he likes. And usually he <laughs> wants me to push it even further. You know, because I'm used to working with people that are scared of color, you know, when I'm not working with him. So when I work with him, I'm like, oh, right, he likes color. I can do the things that I actually really like to do when I work with him, you know? And so it's so, it's so, it's so freeing. It's so freeing. It's so collaborative. And I think it shows in my work. I think that's why 
the costumes are so good because you know I was allowed to like really play and like push it further and you know um he was like the most involved in um the keeps costumes because you know there's a story like Lakeep's costumes parallel the the movie's you know main storyline um you know as things are changing in our world his his looks are changing and so we sat down together and really broke that down and really talked about you know okay you know once he starts getting paid as an informant how does that inform his look and then okay you know he would tell me things like you know he doesn't know if he's a fed or a panther so we need to see that in his clothing so you know when he meets up with Mitchell I would like him in suits and I'm like that's great. That's a great idea, you know? And then, you know, over time we see the suits that he meets up with Mitchell and change. Like at first it's pretty formal, it's shirt and tie, then it's like a suit and a turtleneck. And then it's like a whole other thing with a leather pea coat. And, um, and like, he's really confused that by the end, he doesn't know if he is a fed or a panther. And that whole through line in his costumes came from Shock and I collaborating on those story points and those, um, you know, and his character. Um, yeah, like he just really encourages me to just like go really, really far and that's beautiful. And it makes it really hard sometimes to work with other people. <laughs> <laughs> I think what, what you spoke to there, I thought what you did with the Lakeith thing was phenomenal because it felt you were in his head as you were mm -hmm. turning up the notch, you know, and the sunglasses and he's mm -hmm. coming in and you're like, oh, he's getting paid. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, just how mm -hmm. and, you know there's an almost how his character shifts between between you know when he's in his panther um, uniform and then when he's kind of um gaining that momentum and I think you're I, I love what you said about speaking to the confusion in the end where mm -hmm. he's this torn man who doesn't know who he is I thought it was absolutely incredible and Sean for you I, I'd love to hear about again how you work with Shaka but also because again, I feel like there's such a delicacy and nuance in what you did, but I'd love to hear how you built and created. It, Shaka was great for me because I remember when I met him um, and it was over video and we got chatting about everything. And, you know, I was talking to him about the reflectivity and, and this and that. And, and he was like, look, I'm just going to leave you to it. Just do what you do. And, and and I'll check in every so often. That's literally what he did. Um, mm. You know, I went, I, you know, in the early stages of the prep, I came to him and I said, look, I think I'm, I want to do two prosthetic makeups. One will be on Lakeith for the Eyes on the Prize video because we have to take him just 20 years, but there needs to be a very subtle prosthetic application because Lakeith is so hollow in the cheeks so that we fill him out a bit. So, you know, we did a, a, a prosthetic for that and he was game on. I mean, it was a huge, huge makeup movie. I mean, this, like hearing you all talk about it, I, I could talk literally for hours because there's so much detail. There's such a richness. I can't wait to watch the film over and over again. What are you most proud of of this film? Like knowing everything that went into it um, and knowing how huge it was. Like what, what are you most proud of? Um, Charlize, I'll start with you. Um, I'm proud that I love every single costume in this movie because that doesn't always happen. You know, um, I definitely have watched some of my work where I'm like, oh yeah, that was the person that was flown in like the day of, and I didn't get to quite, you know, do this or that thing. I mean, and to everyone else, it looks great, you know? But to me, I'm like thinking of ways I could have done something different or better. I don't feel that way about any costumes in this movie. And that's like a testament to one, my neuroses, and two, <laughs> and two, um, having an amazing team. Uh, uh, a multiracial intergenerational team, you know, um, who knew the period and worked their asses off with me. Um, and also, again, having an amazing collaborator such as Shaka, who just like, you know, it has faith in me and lets me do my thing. And so, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I've, I've already won, you know, like when I wrapped that movie and I was so happy with myself and happy with my work and happy with how everything turned out and happy with the relationships that I formed. I was like, I, you know, awards and nominations are like, they're cool, but I don't need that. Cause I I'm satisfied with this experience in my work. 
And, and Sean, how about you? I'm happy that we honoured Fred. We did it for Fred. I'm happy that people who haven't had a voice globally now have a voice through the movie. With regard to my work, I'm very, I, I read a review yesterday. One of my team sent me this, this review from Sundance and the guy reviewing was talking about how beautiful the skin looked and how reflective and how, and it was like, oh my God, he sees it, he gets it. And I've had people, friends of mine, um, you know, African-American women and men literally texting me going, thank you so much for seeing us. You really see us. And, and for me, for people to not feel seen, it, it literally, you can just pull my heart. You know, I wanted people to really feel beautiful and to have their skin look exquisite. And, and Rebecca, uh, same for you. Um, well, you know, being that we were, you know, having to um, replicate really looks, I was most proud early on. I mean, I'm not going to lie, I have a little bit of an ego. So when I <laughs> was able to get past, um, you know, Chairman Fred, uh, Fred Jr. and his mother approval, um, I felt like I had won already, like Sharon was saying, in the sense of being able to replicate styles and fit them with actors and have the actors feel comfortable because natural hair is something that isn't new for all, but new for many of people, you know, to be used to and to see themselves in such a way. But also um, the other part that I'm most proud of, I would say is that the, I was, my team was able to articulate natural hair and how it changes from day to day and how it is affected through the weather and the heat and the, all the different elements of the day. So, and then also my team, these two ladies right here, I was proud of them. So um, given the availability of the archive and access that you had to uh, pictures and people, some of them still living, mm -hmm. um, I'd love to hear from each of you how much of that you chose to stay really true to and if there were things that you chose you know were more of an interpretation um can you tell us about the decisions you made and why um Charlize I'm looking at you because <laughs> I'll start with you okay cool um any of our characters who were based on actual um public figures or people uh, we for costumes that was like our starting point because Obviously, like, you know, for example, um, for, you know, Daniel who's playing Chairman Fred, he had like 20 or 30 changes. I can't remember the exact number. I didn't have that many different pictures of Chairman Fred in different outfits. I might've had five to 10, right? And so for every character like that who was based on an actual person, I looked at the archival footage of them and picked out like key elements that made their style, silhouettes and things like that, and just determined what their style would be, you know, in the 60s and also looked at photos of other, you know, other people during that time of, you know, fashion magazines and things like that to determine like, okay, this is this person's style and this is the starting point and we expand from here and make it cohesive and feel like, oh yes, this person would have these other things in their closet, mm -hmm. right? And so I'll use Bob, uh, Bobby Rush, who's played by um, Dale Britt Gibson and, um, Chairman Fred, who's played by Dan Kaluuya, is two examples. So, um, you know, Chairman Fred was a, a college student and a former athlete. He played football. So, you know, his silhouettes are very simple. You know, like in the beginning, you see him in a cardigan because he wasn't too long out of college. And, you know, and then you see him in mainly like t-shirts and crew necks, you know, um, straight leg jeans, things like that. And then he gets a little bit more militarized. So he starts wearing like camel pants, you know, um, the camel jacket. I had images of him wearing lots of like mock, mock neck turtlenecks and dark colors. So put him in a lot of that as well. Um, and then Delbert Gibson's playing Bobby Rush, who is a public figure who's still alive, he's Senator Bobby Rush. Um, and all the images I had of him from that time, he was very mod. And so use that as a basis and then just expand it from there. And so it was like, every time you see Bobby Rush, our Bobby Rush on camera, he feels mod. He's got the beetle boots, he's got slacks. He was a little bit older than everyone. He was in his mid twenties. Everybody was in like their late teens, early twenties, everybody else was. So he was a little bit more put together and he was a little bit more of the early sixties, you know, his, his vibe, right? And so the only person that we didn't have that much information on were 
you know, characters that were obviously, um, you know, fictional, like Judy Harmon, you know, was a character that Shaka made up, but we talked about her, her journey as a character and like, she's just always ready. She's always ready. She got a knife in her boot. So, you know, she's just always ready to go. She's in uniform all the time, right? And then, you know, um, as far as O'Neal, I had, I had like three images of him. I had an image of him in a camo coat with a beret on his shoulder, like stuff in the epaulette right here. And then I had um, an image of him super flashy with sunglasses and a neckerchief and a spread collar shirt. And I was like, oh, like if that's his vibe, I'm pushing that, you know, like even further. Um, and then obviously the eyes on the prize footage. So, you know, we recreated that gray suit and match that. So um, yeah, for some characters like Chairman Fred, it was really important to like recreate those exact looks or silhouettes, but other people it was like a starting point and then building a closet from there. And Rebecca, how, how about you? Um, well, I felt a responsibility to honor the looks of each character, at least the ones like Charlize was saying that we could identify and, you know, pretty much go from there. But um, the most important part to me was that Chicago is specific to California, is specific to the East Coast, that I wanted to specifically be and make sure I stayed in Chicago and that the Afros didn't grow, um, they weren't huge. Everybody didn't have that and that we still had our old ladies with the church wigs and we still had people who were pressing their hair. We had braids, we had um, bangs, we had all, you know, we had updos, we had all sorts of things. And my team, uh, Charlize was saying as well, was multicultural and also age appropriate. I had people who had lived through that, worked through it and, you know, across the board, black, white, everybody. Um, and so it was important to make sure that I honored that and also made it feel as real as possible. So, you know, I hope that uh, it was conveyed, but yeah. And Sean. It well, you know, it's for me, it, it's not a lookalike competition kind of thing. So what we have is a collective of actors, each of who signifies the character that they're playing and each who's going to bring it through in their performance. Um, in terms of, of how, on how honorable I was to the original people. I took elements of everybody, you know, like with Fred, it was Daniel's facial hair, um, his, his sideies um, and, and making them fit his face. Just so it, it's Chairman Fred's style, but it fits Daniel's face. With Deb, it was her brows. With Bobby Rush, with Daryl, it was making sure that his mustache was a little bit fuller because Daryl has very um, delicate facial hair and also brows making sure they were right. With Lakeith, it was changing the eye orbit area, you know, making his brow shape different, making his facial hair match, um, just giving him those elements. That's amazing. And something interesting that you all picked up on um, early in the beginning is the sort of um, lack of nuanced representation of the Panthers on screen. And I was wondering, was there anything in terms of that you wanted to steer away from in terms of like visual stereotypes of the Panthers. And can you talk to me a little bit about what those were and, and why you made decision, you know, how you made the decisions? Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I'll go first because I think when we think of Panthers, we obviously think of wardrobe and clothing. And, and I, you know, over the years I've seen people taking pictures on social media and they've got their fist up and they've got a beret and a leather jacket and a black turtleneck. And so I just didn't want it to feel like Black Panther cosplay. I wanted it to feel real and also specific to this particular chapter. Mm -hmm. And as I did, you know, research about the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party um, and what it was, it was a hub for mm -hmm. the, for the party, the, um, you know, Chairman Fred Jr. and I were just talking and he told me recently that all the newspapers that the Panthers were selling and give in um that the Panthers were creating and selling were printed in Chicago. And I was like, I never knew that, right? And so it had its own specific vibe and the camo jacket was like very specific to the Illinois party. And and finding that out and you know, a lot of the camo jackets worn were from World War II. Um, some people who were also coming back from the Vietnam War were joining the Panthers and wearing those camo jackets and just removing the U.S. Army patches from them. So you see like far less leather in our movie than you might expect. And then I think, you know, 
by that happening, I think it causes people to research specifically the Illinois party and figure out why that is, because it, it was very specific to that party. And so, and I didn't want it, I didn't want the costumes to take people out of the story. You know, like if everyone was all in leather and all in berets all the time and like no one had a personality and had their own style, like, you know, it just, to me, it just, um, I don't think it would, it would have landed the same. I don't think the movie would have been the same if everyone was like, leather clad all the time it would have felt like cosplay <laughs> i think you're right and i think what also what i felt was really beautiful about it is i think sometimes when you see the panthers on screen it's almost like you say it's almost like they weren't living in those you know it's like people had put something on whereas in this it's like they were working they were you know the, there was um there's just a depth to that there was that mm -hmm. felt really nuanced um yeah, Rebecca, yeah. Did you want, oh, sorry, go on, Charlize. Uh, I just wanted to add one yeah. more thing. So a lot of the imagery we see of Panthers are of them doing demonstrations in uniform. So that's why it you you that resonates with you. Because mm -hmm. that was a uniform, the leather jacket, the beret, the sunglasses. It was worn as a uniform. It was worn to conceal their identity. It was worn for protection. Mm -hmm. So that's why you don't really see the break and file members, you know, doing clerical work and things like that. But you see that in our movie for the first time. But there are images of that if you do the research and you look for them. Rebecca, did you want to jump in on that point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, you know, in the 1960s, men of color were still using process, you know, relaxing your hair to process it and brush it back and still like Sammy Davis Jr. was still doing it. And so for myself, I just wanted to make sure that we showed, you know, like Lakeith and Daniel both have their hair going, it's being brushed back. But as far as like the Afros go, it was important that it was, they're small still. People weren't still, the freedom of what natural hair embodies is there's a journey that comes with it. And the length doesn't happen overnight. So to have these huge Afros that really come into play into not until like the mid seventies and we get into disco, that it was important that I kept them small and that even um, I think of my own hair, I use my own as an example for my team because not a lot of even hairdressers on our side of things all have natural hair um, for whatever reason that may be. But I wanted to make sure that I showed people to look at in the morning, this is what it looks like. And to think of like all of the different stages that it takes on. And so it was important for me to um, show that with my team, but then also just for myself. Like it was just, it was something I really held on to in the imperfections. I didn't want to have those hard hairlines and have anything look costumey. Like I just wanted the hair not to look, um, I want to look authentic as possible, but in honor of the, the timeline in which that, what that meant to wear your hair natural as a woman. And even to today, it wasn't until what, in November of this year that the Crown Act was passed in states we're allowed to wear our hair naturally and still get hired for any job that we want. And it's a non-issue, but uh, with Cicely Tyson passing and what she had done for, you know, natural hair for women of color. So it was so personal and artistic at the same time that I would be lying to you to say that it wasn't as it was the journey intertwines. And I mean, that leads me on to what was my final question, which is, you know, there is, as we've talked about again and again, such uh, like so many layers of truthfulness. There's such a depth in this. What were the what were the biggest challenges for you guys in 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 sort of getting to to yeah getting to the finished article, so to speak? There was a lot of sort of teamwork and playing and growth for a lot of people. I had artists come up to me at the end and just say, wow, this has been the biggest learning curve of my career to date. Thank you so much. And I'm like, that's fantastic. On this movie as well. That's a, that's a really beautiful thing because I think the whole movie is a learning curve. Whether you're watching it or whether you're participating in it, it's a huge, it's a huge process to have all of that. And, and yeah, that's why I said it was a huge, huge makeup movie. <laughs> I think it was the logistics for me. Um, we were shooting in Cleveland and it's a place that doesn't have a ton of resources like we're used to if you're shooting in LA, for example. So um, there were there were some like vintage shops and you know places that I could get 60s um, pieces from and my shopper and my assistant designer, you know, shopped a lot there, but we had clothes coming in from all over the country constantly. <laughs> we had someone in LA who was still working in LA, pulling stuff for us. 
while we were shooting and shipping it to us constantly. So I think logistically it was crazy. Um, my wardrobe supervisor lost it a few times, <laughs> um, but everything <laughs> looks really great. And then the, the other side of it was for me as like a black woman, like living this trauma every day took a toll on me um, because it, you know, it, it, everything looks so real and authentic. Like our production designer, Sam is amazing. Like I would step on set and be like, I'm instantly transformed into the sixties and you feel it. And you, you like, you know, like I said, as a black woman, like I felt it, it's like in my DNA, you know, like my family lived through this kind of stuff. And um, it took a lot when we wrapped to like unpack all of that, you know, because I was so deep in it. I was so deep in the research. I was so involved in the characters' journeys and stories and building these characters with the actors and, you know, literally every morning me and Daniel had therapy together. <laughs> like we were in chair, like getting dressed and we would, we were having therapy every morning. So, um, you know, it was the logistics and it was also the emotional piece for me. Um, and Rebecca, how about you? Um, I would say, I think not to piggyback on what Charlize was saying, but in agreement with, um, the actors, I think for me was the challenge of making sure, or actually just reminding them like in conjunction with everything that's happening with the film industry, that it was important to have um, your voice heard and to have people in trailers that know how to take care of you mm -hmm. and to stop getting your hair cut at a barber shop and make sure you keep people employed and require people to know how to do your hair, to do how to do your makeup, to know how to dress you. and of their treatment level. Like we turned our hair trailer into a full salon spa. It was like, I mean, it wasn't even a spa because it wasn't about the, I wasn't romanticizing anybody, but it was a hundred percent like how to moisturize your hair. And I was going through it like daily with my team and what to do and we were steaming everybody. It was just, it was a factory of like hair and wigs and everything. But um, the most important thing to me was the biggest challenge was staying with that. And my team also with that aligned value that, it was about showing these young men and women that their voices on the next set that they go to require their standard to be elevated and require directors to hear them and ADs and their agents and to know how to speak up for themselves and ask for what they want because it really starts with us and then it trickles on when they get to set. And so keeping that standard um, is always something I've had for myself, but now to be able to give back because I'm a little bit older than, oh, probably 10 years, 15 years older than some of these actors. So keeping that and saying, and you know, really honoring it and wanting to protect them. So that was it. Thank you guys again. I just, you know, the film is amazing. Each of your, your work um, individually and collectively phenomenal so congratulations again and Charlize I know you said it's not about the award but you deserve all of the awards going because it really is I, I just think it's one for the ages so thank you so much you. for giving us your time and congratulations again thank you so thank much you. it's so nice thank to meet you, you. lovely nice to, meet you. to meet you thank you all so much for watching at home Judas and the Black Messiah will be out soon and you'll be able to watch it on the BFI player <laughs>